cerebral column resection for severe kyphosis. This patient has congenital kyphosis. She is 33 years of age and has congenital thoracolumbar kyphosis. The patient had a previous posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation when she was 11 years old. The instrumentation was loose and prominent. She had subsequent removal of the instrumentation, and ever since, she had increasing kyphosis. Her motor and sensory examination is normal. These are plain radiographs of the patient showing the severe thoracolumbar kyphosis. The 3D model not only demonstrates the different anatomy that is seen from right versus left, but posteriorly the fusion mass is well visualized and the small defect in the fusion mass is seen, which can be problematic if one is not expecting that in the approach. This is a clinical photograph of the patient showing the previous incision and the thoracolumbar kyphosis. The lumbar spine is then approached. First, the Smith-Peterson osteotomy is performed by removing some of the fusion mass that is overgrown with an osteotome. This is done on both sides. And then the canal is encountered. A rondra is used to remove the excess bone. A kerosin rongeur is then used to remove the ligamentum flavum as well as the facet capsule and the facet joint partially to go through the foramen to perform a release of the posterior elements so there is plenty of mobility at the osteotomy site. After all the screws are in the thoracic and lumbar spine, additional Smith-Peterson osteotomy is performed approximately over the fusion mass. First, the aggressive burr is used, then the diamond tip burr is used till the ligamentum flavum. The ligamentum flavum is then removed and the kerosene rongeur is just taken through the foramen. Now one can see the resection edges proximally and distally where the Smith-Peterson osteotomies have been performed. The ribs are dissected. As you can see, the ribs are quite different in appearance. The ribs are then cut, leaving a small portion of the rib attached to the rib head to the midline. The foramen is then found, and then the canal is entered laterally to medially. And a burr is used to thin down the lamina on the lateral surface where the canal is entered. After this is done, the rongeur is used to debulk the bone. More of the bone is thinned down with a burr, and a kerosene rongeur is used to disconnect the dorsal lamina with the vertebral bodies. The Woodson is used to define where the pedicles are and where the canal is. In this way, the pedicles are identified, and the kerosene rongeur is used to remove the pedicles. In this manner, the dorsal lamina is completely disconnected from the vertebral bodies that are going to be resected. The rib heads are then isolated. The pleura is bluntly dissected off the rib heads, and the rib heads are then removed sequentially. Nerve roots are identified and dissected and then sacrificed after tying off the proximal and distal ends of the nerve roots. You can see now that the rib heads are removed from both sides. Now, the lateral portion of the spine is, is approached. Hemostasis is achieved with bipolar cautery, and dissection is carried out of the lateral portion of the spine. Blunt dissection can be used to expose the anterior portion of the spine. All the soft tissue is dissected away from the anterior portion of the spine. Sponges are used to protect the soft tissue from the anterior portion of the spine. Bipolar cautery and electrocautery is used to maintain hemostasis. The Woodson elevator is now displaying how the canal has been entered and the dorsal lamina is completely free from both sides of the vertebral bodies and the vertebral body resection can be started. Before resecting the anterior vertebral bodies, temporary rod is placed to stabilize the construct so no sudden movement can produce neurologic injury. Ribbon retractors and gauze sponges can be used anterior 
to the spine to protect the soft tissues. Sponges are also used to protect the anterior portion of the spine. Now the vitreal bodies are decancellated with a burr and also using various size curettes to decancellate the vitreal bodies. In this portion of the video, you can see the posterior wall is still intact. The vitreal bodies have been removed. Now the disc spaces are identified and the cartilaginous end plate is removed with a cob elevator, rongeurs, and curettes. This provides a very clean, bony surface, superiorly and inferiorly, where the anterior spinal fusion is going to take place. Now the posterior wall is intact still, and the lateral portion of the posterior wall is removed with large pituitary rongeurs. Now you can see that the posterior wall is being dissected away from the dura, so there's no adhesion between the spinal cord and the posterior wall. And a downgoing curette is used to push down the posterior wall away from the spinal cord. Any bony fragments or soft tissue is removed. Now you can see the pulsations of the dura with complete resection of all the bone anterior to the spinal cord. There's a significant angulation that can be appreciated where the cage is going to go, and our goal would be to take those end plates and make them parallel before the cage is placed anteriorly. The posterior dorsal lamina is then freed completely and removed from the posterior part of the dura, taking away all the adhesions. This actually is a very safe way to hold the spinal cord while anterior decompression is being performed. The adhesions between the dorsal lamina and the spinal cord and dura hold the dura higher and prevent it from falling down so you're not constantly bumping into it when you're removing the posterior wall. Now the spinal cord is free. You can see the pulsations. You can see posteriorly it's thoroughly decompressed and anteriorly is thoroughly decompressed as well, as shown as this picture, and the angulation of the vitreal bodies are quite apparent. Any soft tissue or bony elements remaining are checked and removed. Now compression is applied to the rods sequentially to shorten the deformity and relax the spinal cord in this manner sequential compression, and then the rods are exchanged a couple times by taking out the rod, under bending it, and then placing it on one side, and then replacing it on the other side, thus decreasing the kyphosis. In situ bending is then performed. This maneuver eliminates the kyphosis, but also angulates the, the bodies from being at a sharp angle to more parallel. Additional compression is then applied through these temporary rods to create more correction of the kyphosis. So we've used cantilever compression and also in situ bending to correct the kyphosis. Now the final rods are placed, but before doing that, one rod is left intact. Additional Stability is applied with a distractor holding the two vertebral bodies distracted. So this provides a more stable construct. The rod on the other side is then cut to size, contoured, and anchored proximally. And then with cantilever, it's dropped down into the lower part of the construct into the lumbar spine. Additional compression is also applied after replacing the other rod. This really shows the final correction of the kyphosis. Now, anterior vitreal bodies are more parallel, and a cage is sized and placed anterior from end plate to end plate. This photograph shows the placement of the cage and the correction of the kyphosis, the shortening posteriorly, and the lengthening anteriorly of the spinal column. This is a photograph of the image intensifier showing the placement of the cage. An additional rod is placed across the three column osteotomy to make it more mechanically sound and prevent early rod failure. 
The dorsal lamina that was resected from the fusion over the skyphosis is that fashioned and shortened and placed over the dura that's exposed and tied down with suture to hold it in position. Some grooves are made into the lamina to prevent the sutures from slipping. This provides protection of the exposed spinal cord from mechanical compression as well as hematoma formation and compression. This is a final photograph showing the construct, multiple rods, dorsal lamina protecting the open spinal cord area to provide also a area of fusion and then all the bone and BMP placed proximally distally. What is not shown is the anterior bone graft that's placed adjacent to the cage on the sides. This radiograph shows the correction of the thoracolumbar kyphosis. There's a small coronal deformity that's residual in the lumbar spine, but there's a significant improvement of the thoracolumbar kyphosis. This photograph shows the clinical improvement of the thoracolumbar kyphosis in the patient. In summary, preoperative planning is crucial. One should consider making 3D models to further study the deformity. One should place all the fixation points before any osteotomy is started. Stabilize the area of the osteotomy before vertebral body resection. The principles of correction are shortening, rod exchange, inside tube bending, and compression with cantilever. Anterior column support is mandatory. In this case, we used an expandable cage and bone graft. Multiple rods that are crossing the vertebral column resection site help early rod failure. Posterior protection of the cord can be performed with allograft or a cage to prevent from compression. The bone provides another source of fusion across that big gap.